Welcome back to War Economy and State. This is the foreign policy podcast for the Mises Institute. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor with the Mises Institute. And with me is one of my favorite foreign policy writers for us, Zachary Yost. And uh, we do this every month, in case you haven't uh, been a listener so far. We get together and talk about some of the foreign policy issues from a more Misesian view, that is to say, more anti interventionist view. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about, since it's year end, this is where we go on record being wrong about lots of stuff because <laughs> we're, we're going to do predictions. This will be our annual predictions show. And uh, we got lots of stuff we could talk about. But uh, I, I don't want this this episode to go for an hour, so we're going to uh, just see how much we can get through and see what needs to be said in a variety of topics. Um, but And there's a lot going on. Uh, a couple of years ago, maybe there wasn't uh, enough that was maybe salient in people's minds to really uh, sustain a full episode, but boy, there's... There's all sorts of stuff the U.S. is is involved in this year, which is which is to say a lot, uh, because the U.S. is always meddling in lots of places, but seems to be even more engaged now in a variety of things. And so let's just start uh, with uh, the the oldest news, maybe. Well, actually, maybe Syria would be old news, but let's just talk about Ukraine. Let's <laughs> let's just start there. Um, so things don't look great for Ukraine. Uh, either politically or militarily, and I'm I'm really somewhat surprised at uh, how things have turned out for Ukraine in terms of U.S. domestic policy, because I've been around long enough. I remember Iraq War. Heck, I even remember uh, Gulf War One or whatever we call that now, the Persian Gulf War, Operation Desert Storm, nineteen uh, early nineteen nineties. And I mean, yeah, I was in junior high, but I remember the politics around it. Um, and there just was no dissent. This was considered a glorious fight. Uh, <laughs> and everybody loved the idea. Uh, remarkably, however, uh, people, Americans, voters, your more intelligent Republicans don't even seem to care anymore about Ukraine. And the rhetoric I'm seeing around it is quite remarkable. You would have never seen this 20, 30 years ago, which is, hey, we just sent, or the plan is to send another $100 billion right on top of the current 100 plus billion. They're pushing for another 100 billion or so. And you see people like uh, Thomas Massey and other opponents of US involvement in the war pointing out that with that sort of money, <laughs> you could do all of these things on the domestic front. And uh, on on this topic, I'm often kind of find myself sounding like uh, our old friend Anthony Gregory, who used to uh, back in the olden times. He's a historian now. He used to write a lot for uh, for us and uh, for other hardcore liber libertarian organizations. And his point was, look, if you're just going to blow a bunch of government money on stuff, it seems like it would be better to at least like, I don't know, build hospitals or roads or something with it that Americans could actually use rather than blowing up a bunch of stuff in a useless war that doesn't actually benefit Americans. And so it seems a lot of people are actually really seriously, people of influence are making this argument now. And uh, that's not good for Zelensky and Ukraine. So I guess really the question is, how much longer does Ukraine have left? Do you think that this is the final year really of active hostilities or is this going to go on much longer or is ukraine going to finally admit that they ran out of weapons and it's over um yeah what how what do you predict for the end what's it going to look like at the end of 2024 <laughs> yeah so um yes i'm like basically everyone in my defense, I have quite a track record of being wrong about <laughs> predictions for the Ukraine war. Although I would say, because I, you know, agree with the great sage John Mearsheimer, <laughs> I have a better track record than many of those in favor of the war. But uh, yeah, it's definitely not looking good. I I can't say whether or not the war will be over next year. I think we will find out in the coming months sort of what Russia's planning to do. Uh, and that will, of course, affect, <laughs> affect the outcome a lot. 
basically this past year. So so here's my, now that we are almost two years into this, here we have a better idea of what what was going on at the beginning of the war, which helps us better understand what's been going on. At the beginning of the war, Russia invaded Ukraine with less than 300,000 troops, many tens of thousands of which were from the uh, the little breakaway republics, so not exactly, you know, crack sped snatch troops. And as John Mearsheimer has pointed out many times, this is obviously inadequate to actually invade and conquer Ukraine, if that was the Russian goal, which it does not seem to be. It's, it, in hindsight, it seems the goal was to just sort of be belligerent and threatening and make the Ukrainians cave into the Russian demands of separating from its sort of de facto joining of NATO and alignment with the West and probably a reorganization, reorientation, more federal system for the Russian speakers and Russian ethnic groups in Ukraine. We now know numerous people on the record, including Ukrainian government officials, that there were negotiations going on at the beginning of the war to basically do just that. And then Boris Johnson, with the backing of the U.S., flew into Kiev and was like, don't negotiate with these Russians. The West will back you, you know, fight it out. And so that's what happened. And um, Russia was obviously not prepared for that. And it took them quite a while to shift from basically, you know, threatening Ukraine to fighting the largest sort of conventional war in many decades. And part of that, so that's why there was these huge losses of territory uh, last year and why Russia then had the call up of the reserves, which hadn't been done since like 1945. So that system was obviously very rusty and creaky. All sorts of problems. Well, basically what's been going on this year is Russia has more or less just sort of sat there manning its multiple, you know, its defense in depth lines and just been slaughtering Ukrainians. Uh, and now the one of the main issues for Ukraine is not just equipment, notably artillery shells, but manpower, because the Russians have spent all year just slaughtering them. And uh, we see all sorts of stories from a variety of media coming out about how problematic this is in Ukraine. Basically, men are being kidnapped, Shanghai, sent down the river, however you want to phrase it, just uh, impressed uh by just gangs of thugs uh, and uh, basically getting very little training and being used as cannon fodder. I mean, I think we've mentioned it before, stories of people were sort of, you know, kidnapped off the street, sent to the UK for training and wounded and sent home from the front all in the space of two months. Uh, so... Yeah, and catastrophic that wounds is in many problem. cases, right? We're not talking about, yeah. oh, I, yes. I got shot in the shoulder sort of thing. It, that's a not like there was, I think it was in the, it was either the New York Times or the Washington Post. The number of Ukrainians who lost limbs is like higher than like German levels in World War I or something. I mean, like 50 or 70,000 people have lost limbs because mines are all over the place. Uh, and uh, that's going to take decades to clean up. But um, so that's the big issue. Manpower shortages and ammunition, notably artillery shell shortages. And now, now we're seeing that uh, we're, <laughs> we're seeing that as the ship is starting to sink, now there's a lot of infighting going on among the Ukrainian elites, who already hated each other, have been fighting over the spoils amongst each other since the Soviet Union collapsed. 
But now things are getting pretty serious. There was a quite notable piece in Time magazine where people in Zelensky's own administration have openly said Zelensky is um, delusional. Uh, it, was, it was basically because of, he continues to insist Ukraine will achieve total victory, meaning the reclamation of all of the territory that broke away and everything the Russians have captured and Crimea. And I mean, that's cloud cuckoo land. It's almost certain Russia would end up dropping at least a low yield tactical nuclear weapon in the event Crimea was at risk. Oh, excuse me. So uh, that, yeah, that is delusional. And that's not all though. Um, there's now a great deal of infighting <laughs> within the military. So his name is uh, Zaluzhny. I'm not sure if I'm exactly pronouncing that correctly, but he's the commander in chief of the Ukrainian armed forces. And in an interview with The Economist, he flat out said, the war's at a stalemate. Within days, just immediately after that, Zelensky was like, no, no, <laughs> there's no stalemate. Where if you look at a map of what territory has changed hands in the past year, <laughs> It's obviously a stalemate. Everyone's comparing it to World War I. I do not know, but we might see in the coming months once the ground's frozen, because now it's a giant mud pit, it might no longer be a stalemate because Russia's just been building up. They've, they've not instituted another round of the draft this year because, at least according to them, they've had like 350 or 400,000 new recruits. They've had a very aggressive recruitment campaign. Um, so they now have amassed a lot more forces. They've ramped up their sort of old, uh, military industrial base, which as John Mearsheimer said, is designed to fight world war one. And, oh, look, we're fighting world war one, basically. Uh, so it might no longer be a stalemate for much longer, but then what happened <laughs> is Zeluzhny's right hand man, some major, it was his birthday, and it's very unclear exactly what happened, but it seems he was opening gifts with his son, and one of the gifts was like some like grenade shot glasses or something, and it like, oh look, it turns out one of them was an actual grenade that we set off, and uh, he's dead, and his son's gravely injured. So people, I mean, this is not just like fringe speculation. The BBC reported like, yeah, some people in Ukraine are questioning <laughs> this. Uh, it happened like five days after this spat happened between Zeluzhny and Zelensky. So some people are like, oh, that was a shot across the bow. Or maybe they thought Zeluzhny would be there. Could have been the Russians. Could have been Ukrainians. Who knows? Now there's a new story that's broken out in the Ukrainian media. Oh, turns out Zeluzhny's office is bugged by Ukraine. It's not bugged by Russian intelligence. And the, the excuse is, oh, that was bugged by the previous president back from 2014. So, I mean, who knows exactly what's going on, but it seems to be getting pretty dirty. And uh, there's reports in the media that Zelensky is like going around Zeluzhny in the chain of command to like his loyalists and avoiding Zelensky loyalists. And uh, yeah, so that's well, all these things are just the things that happen a in a regime when it starts to lose and and it becomes yes. obvious that you're losing. You could point to any number of wars and conflicts, including, uh, let's say, the, the Confederacy in the U.S., where as soon as it looks like it's over, the wheels start to come off in terms of internal politics and the factions yes. start to bust. There's recriminations. Uh, people pick uh, which side they're on and which loyal group they're in, which splinter group, uh, which they think will somehow lead them to victory and all of that. And that's all going on there right now. Because, yeah, without uh, another hundred billion from the U.S. isn't even going to be enough. Um Right. Yes. The, the U.S. government, as I'm pretty sure we've mentioned before, is funding not just the war, but like the whole Ukrainian state. That's that's come out. Ukrainians too in will not be getting pensions. Right? 
In we're we're funding weeks, like every single school teacher in Ukraine, the American yes. taxpayer. Schools, pensions, firemen. And we all know how the bureaucrats. American standard of living is just couldn't be better. How Americans, everything is fine. Our, our yeah. cities are clean. <laughs> our bridges are safe. So we just got extra money to go pay Ukrainian school teachers. Yes. And by, in typical U.S. war for democracy fa fashion, too, Ukraine is a police state. There's if you're a Russian Orthodox Christian, you can't attend divine liturgy because the churches have been closed in many cases by the regime. Uh, there's, of course, no freedom of speech. You can't freely uh, criticize Zelensky. Uh, elections have been uh, postponed indefinitely. That's that's democracy as usual that America defends. Right. And and earlier this year, a few months ago, everyone would have been shrieking, you know, rah, Russian Putinist propagandists, how much is the, the, the Kremlin paying you off? Now it's just openly talked about. And the mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, I think his name is, who uh, sort of even more nationalist than Zelensky, he's on the record saying basically Zelensky is turning into a tyrant and he has this quote, at some point, we will no longer be any different from Russia, where everything depends on the whim of one man, that one man being Zelensky, and uh, on us just throwing money at Ukraine. In the same Time magazine article where people in the administration said Zelensky is delusional, another person in the administration, very foolishly, everything's always on the record when you're talking to the press, unless you say, and the press agrees, you can't just say, here's a tip, you can't just say, this is off the record. The reporter has to agree <laughs> that it's off the record. But this guy in the administration told this reporter during the timepiece, he said, turn off your, <laughs> turn off your recorder. Uh, because the, the guy was like, oh, you know, isn't a lot being done to fight uh, corruption. And this administration official said, turn off your recorder. And then he said, um, people are stealing like there's no tomorrow. This is not some uh, Russian stooge. This is a person in the presidential administration foolishly thinking he was off the record. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's uh, Ukraine is not doing well and it depends what how what Russia does. Um, well, do you think that Russia, been... uh, so are they, is Russia just going to be satisfied with the territory it currently has? No, no. Uh, and this is the other thing of why this was such a foolish mistake for the uh, Ukrainians to listen to the West. Uh, because Ukraine, if it seems pretty likely... Ukraine would be intact and there would not have been any annexed territories other than Crimea. But it became clear uh, when Russia oh, sort of, uh, you know, got stuck in this big mess they weren't prepared for, okay, we have to carve Ukraine up and make sure it's a defunct mess uh, going forward. I agree with John Mearsheimer. Russia's going to attempt to, one, claim the whole Black Sea coast, especially Odessa, which historically a very Russian city. It's something like, in the poll, like less than 10% of the population said they would willingly fight for Ukraine. <laughs> um, it's just historically a very Russian city. So, Well, and let's note also, also that coastline is an extremely important factor. Right, yes. Yeah, strategically, it's going to uh, be a problem for Ukraine and the EU going forward. And the way maritime I law mean, works now is if you can secure the coastline, you get rights to miles miles off the coast in terms of drilling rights, shipping mm -hmm. rights, all that stuff. So so thanks to what Russia's done so far, it now has total control of the Sea of Azov, which very important right, yeah, for those yeah. shipping routes from uh, if the, if they if Russia can get its act together and put in some decent canals and stuff, it opens up that whole trade route from the Bosporus to uh, to the uh, to the Caspian Sea, basically, because mm -hmm. now you could have a, a route from the Don River going up the Don River from the Sea of Azov through a canal over uh, to um, well, what was called Stalingrad, <laughs> and 
Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, Volga, Volga yeah, the, other, the major river in <laughs> southern Russia, <laughs> uh, the Volga River, and then down into the Caspian Sea. So you, you're opening up all of that stuff. Um, and so now you don't have to worry with Crimea and the coastline there. You don't have to worry about any Ukraine involvement through any of that now. And the Sea of Azov's are right. shallow. And you can drill oil or whatever in there you want to do. And so that's people forget about that. Russia is not giving back Mariupol um, yes, or any right. of that coastline. And they've actually invested a lot of money in rebuilding it, actually. I mean, but uh, the other thing is, is now Ukraine will not be able to export agricultural produce via mm. sea. It'll have to go through the EU which is already, this is the other issue where Ukraine is just in trouble. They've alienated in more and more Europeans, notably Poland, <laughs> uh, which even though uh, sort of the EU stooge, uh, whose name escapes me, is now the, the new prime minister, the president is still very anti-Ukraine. Ukraine aid, basically. He's the one, I believe, who said that, oh, Ukraine is like a drowning victim who risks pulling the uh, rescuer down under. And there's a big tr trucker sort of protest in uh, Poland where they're blocking border crossings because of uh, sort of cut rate Ukrainian shipping and well, the produce, the produce is supposed to transit through the EU, but that's not happening. It's actually being sold and undercutting all the EU subsidized agriculture and everything. So it, by securing the coast, Russia just foists this problem onto the EU, which that's the thing. Ukraine at the end, whether that's at the end of next year or into 2025, uh, Ukraine is just going to be a millstone around the neck of Europe. It's going to be dysfunctional. It's going to be just a basket case economically because most most of what's going to be left is Eastern Ukraine, which is the poorest, most underdeveloped. No, you mean part Western? Of Ukraine. Yes. yes, Western Ukraine. Western Ukraine. I always, <laughs> I have a weird thing of looking at the world from the U.S. and so it's like the Far East. Is the West, you know, manifest destiny. We just keep so going. So in west. your office, your globe anyway. is upside down. You, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, right. Yes. Uh, Western Ukraine, the poorest part of Ukraine. Um, so uh, they, there is like this big celebratory thing of like, oh, Ukraine has been granted like candidate status at the EU. One thing, just ask Turkey how that goes. They've been there for over a decade. <laughs> They're not getting in anytime soon. Neither is Which Ukraine. Which is much poorer than Turkey, because... by the way. Ukraine isn't even, right, Ukraine's yes. much poorer than like the poorest current EU country, which I think is Bulgaria. So it's not even in the same league. Yeah, that or Romania. Yeah. yeah. So they're not getting in. And here's the other thing. Ukraine as a state, one, I mean, they already don't have much of a future because varying, I mean, there's differing counts of how many people have left up to 9 million at one point, almost like 70% of which are like women and children, they're not coming back if they can avoid it, especially if what is left is rump state Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Were Ukraine to join the EU, the, it seems likely the country would depopulate very rapidly <laughs> as everyone would move elsewhere to somewhere that's not as poor and economically backwards, um, other than all the pensioners, yeah. basically. So. Ukraine has not much future, and it's basically the West's fault. And I, I had mentioned this in the past, how I'd been at a, an Atlantic Council event in 2016, where John Mearsheimer was on a panel. And I thought he was on a panel with the Ukrainian government official, who was actually the Georgian defense minister. But he explicitly said, uh, what's this quote here? He said, these policies, by which he means NATO expansion and integration of Georgia and Ukraine, are basically leading the Ukrainians and the Georgians down the primrose path. Because on one hand, we are provoking the Russians, causing all sorts of problems, giving them incentive to do damage in Georgia, Ukraine. And the idea the West is going to come to their rescue, you believe much too much in the United States. So that was 2016. He said this is going to happen. It's happened. 
especially because of, uh, I mean, well, it was accelerated because of what's going on in the Middle East now. <laughs> um, but do not trust tragic. the United States to back you up. This is yeah. like an IQ test for a foreign leader at this point. You, the U.S. says, oh, yeah. we'll back you indefinitely. We'll help you defeat these guys. No, they won't. They'll, they'll do it until they get bored, until the Americans get bored with it, or you just uh, cease, or after the Pentagon extracts whatever it wants from your country, weapons contractors get their profit margins back up, and then the U.S. is gone, and then you're done. Uh, and that's essentially what's happened. And I remember working at the Mises Institute back in uh, 2015, 2014, when we were suggesting, hey, in order to uh, calm things down with Russia, maybe you should give at least functional independence to the Donbass and these, these eastern regions of Ukraine. And we got all these Ukrainian nationalists who would show up at like Ron Paul events and try to disrupt the event and stuff. These are Really? <laughs> and they were like, he's trying to give our country away. We have territorial integrity. The Donbass is ours forever, and I will die to defend it and all this stuff. Well, guess what? Tens of thousands of Ukrainian men died to defend it, and it's not going to work. Um, it's for nothing. Yes. This was a part of the country that was heavily, of course, ethnic Russian anyway. And just all this nonsense about territorial integrity or whatever. And then they think that they've got you... That they've that they've tricked you or something. They're like, well, how would you feel if New England broke off and formed another country? Fine, I couldn't care less. <laughs> um, so it's uh, it's very strange how it just I, they had to have been talked into it by the Americans. Just as so we'd rather die by the scores, be maimed by the tens of thousands, than let some tiny village in the Donbass be part of Russia. I mean, who who thinks that's a good idea? But that's that's how it's turned out. And. And in terms of not trusting the U.S., not only has the war screwed over Ukraine, which is now going to be defunct and dysfunctional for the foreseeable future, it's also sort of screwed over the EU, um, which this was pointed out to me uh, a few months ago. So in 2008, the EU GDP was $16.295 trillion. In 2022, and I believe this includes the UK, the EU GDP was 16.64 trillion. So the EU is, I mean, stagnating. And uh, I mean, I've seen on Twitter people be like, we talk about the Euro pores now, but we're not going to talk about that in 10 years because it'll be considered bad taste just to point to, <laughs> similar to pointing out how africa's dirt uh -huh. and uh no specifically i think this war will probably be noted as sort of an important point in this sort of decline because by virtue of the sanctions on russia and whether it was the u.s or ukraine or poland or some combination of all three blowing up the uh Nord Stream pipelines to Germany, German industry is rapidly declining because energy prices have shot through the roof. So energy intensive industry in Europe, especially Germany, which just closed all of its nuclear plants and reopened coal powered plants for some who knows what reason, can't compete now, basically. So on the one hand, great for the US and probably like China and India, bad for the future of Europe. And it's, uh, I mean, since World War II, uh, Europe, especially Western Europe, but now all of Europe has just sort of been American lackeys who are, uh, you know, under the American thumb, which on the one hand, oh good, we can free ride. On the other hand, in the long term, I suspect it'll be looked at as quite a mistake. So I guess that. you could say our prediction for Ukraine is that they're not going to win. They, there will be Correct. there will be no uh, grand victory. Crimea will not be going back. Neither, neither will the coastline of the Sea of Azov. In fact, they may even push farther and try to get the full coastline of the back Black Sea, establishing just total Russian. Basically, they'll just have to share it. The Turks and the Russians share the Black Sea. Russians mostly dominating. Um, that's clearly the overall goal. Ukraine will not disappear totally. There will be a rump Ukraine, probably even including Kiev. Um, yeah. Everything west of the river except uh, Odessa, probably 
uh, will yeah. continue to be Ukraine, but it's going to be very, very poor. Um, and even if the diplomatic situation is not resolved by the end of the year, this is going to be more and more the functional reality is that Eastern Ukraine is going to be Russian and Western Ukraine will be basically a province of the EU, an impoverished province, impoverished, costly province of uh, the EU with its population in many cases drained. Because, yeah, I'm with you. If I if I can get a work permit in Poland, I am not going back. Um yeah, no way. So, yeah, that looks like that's just going to be the reality. Whether it plays out this calendar year, this next calendar year is difficult to say. But Right. And it's questionable. I mean, John Mearsheimer has said several times he thinks it's going to be a North-South Korea situation in terms of just uh, sort of there's going to be... He he has a hard time imagining there'll ever be an actual settlement for the foreseeable future because the West won't tolerate it. The Ukrainian nationalists won't tolerate it. Uh, I mean, Zelensky is really in a tough spot because were he to try to negotiate, it seems he'd probably be replaced by hardline elements, potentially with Western backing. <laughs> so, yeah. Next year going just worse for Ukraine. All right. Well, we better move on to, if we're going to finish this sometime this morning, we better move on to the Middle yeah. East. <laughs> finish it this year. <laughs> uh, so the Middle East, uh, the U.S. is less, well, has expressed less uh, monetary support, perhaps, uh, in this case. And I'm not, sh I'm not sure how we would describe the difference between U.S. involvement in uh, the Israel Hamas situation, uh, simply because I guess just U.S. involvement in the region has just been so long and well established. And if you look at the amount of money mm -hmm. that the U.S. has shipped over there over the decades, it's, it's certainly um, an immense amount. Uh, but it it uh, it'll be interesting to see how much Americans continue to even be interested in in the conflict, uh, and also how it has the potential really to play out in terms of a regional conflict. And this is already going on right now. Now we're hearing about uh, Yemen and the Houthi rebels and the Red Sea shipping routes. I mean, I see this where now the Western powers are saying, oh, we're limiting trade through the Red Sea because Houthi pirates are, are too effective, that they're, they're shutting down the shipping routes. And I'm thinking, what is this hundred billion dollar navy for that the u.s has i mean the u.s is involved in wars in syria ukraine the levant it's threatening um venezuela oh but our navy can't keep shipping lines open which is like the most basic thing that we're told the navy is for uh it seems like we'd be better off with a 19th century British ships running around. <laughs> At least uh, they were, they seem to have more enthusiasm about it. And so the wheels just continue to come off of the whole thing where uh, the Pentagon wants more and more to do and yet doesn't perform its basic functions. Oh, and then don't even mention the southern border, right? I guess you would argue whether the military should be involved in that or not, but... Uh, it clearly uh, has more to do with uh, Americans and their safety than does anything going on in Ukraine. And, and yet that's the military situation we've got going. So, yep, it's the Houthis who are, by the, by the way, connected to Iran. So we're all hearing about how I noticed in the right wing press, we're supposed to get really excited about the fact that Iran is attacking Americans in Syria and uh, Iraq. OK, well, I got a real easy solution. Yes. <laughs> to that problem. You withdraw Americans from those countries, which should never have been there in the first place. Yeah. And so why are we supposed to care about this? But clearly the uh, the state of Israel is trying to get Americans uh, more involved in that, wants them directly bombing uh, Yemen, bombing Syria. They want to, of course, push back if they can the Syrian border farther north, uh, as well as Hezbollah in, um, in the, the borderlands of uh, Israel and Lebanon. We got to push that north. So I, I think the state of Israel seems uh, sees a, a big opportunity here to accomplish some of those larger goals. Um, but what's going to happen to the Gazans in all that? Um, without taking, I mean, you you walk when you're not blatantly pro Tel Aviv on this, 
you get lumped in with these crazy people on like the Harvard campus who want to yeah. kill all Jews uh, or from the river to the sea and push them all out, push them where, I don't know. But uh, the point is <laughs> the Jews are all supposed to die and go away, uh, whether they're, or when they're there in the Holy Land is, is the basic ideology. Okay, well, yeah, we can all agree that's bad. Um, however, the the war against Gaza is, I don't know how you describe it as something other than ethnic cleansing at this point. You've got, and I haven't used that term until right now, uh, because I was waiting just to see how, how much death and destruction uh, they would rain down. But now we're getting close to, what, 20,000 dead in Gaza? And... Don't try and tell me that, oh, well, yeah, but they killed women and children in Israel. Yeah, the total deaths, including Israeli soldiers, was 1,300 in Israel. And there's not going to be many more because they've already secured the Gaza border. So what you're looking at now is uh, more than we're, we're going to soon come across the line of 20 uh, dead for every Israeli dead. Um, and then it's going to be, what, 30, 40, 50? Could it be 100 dead? Well, we'd be looking at 100,000 dead Gazans by the time the bombing campaign is over. So there doesn't really seem to be an actual endgame here that Tel Aviv has in mind except just uh, bomb Gaza into oblivion and hope everybody goes into, into Egypt or maybe some Western country. That's certainly been suggested. Hey, America and Western Europe, just take all the Gazans. Um, yet another Western subsidy yes. for Israel. So um, that I, this is a real hard thing to predict. I have no idea where this is going to go. Yeah, well, so to go back to the Houthis real quick, the the problem with them is that the West, sort of the West, you know, the U.S. has been backing the Saudi war against the rebels for, I don't know, since 2013 or 14, way back when, when it started. Um, and the Houthis are still there. So I've seen some analysis I think is correct that the Houthis are the ideal Iranian proxy since they've already demonstrated their <laughs> staying power. But yes, the Navy, the U.S. Navy in horrible state, um, drastically undermanned, you can always, the joke is you can always tell which vessels are the American vessels in joint naval exercises because the American ones are always completely rust covered and look horrible. Um, yes. Uh, so there was just this announcement of like, oh, this task force, I think it's Operation Prosperity Guardian was announced. And it to me, it's quite annoying. The U.S. has to do most of this to begin with. It's like everyone else has a navy. <laughs> everyone else needs shipping. I mean, do we get much via the uh, the uh, Suez Canal? Probably not. The U.S. specifically. So uh, other people could, you know, step up and take care of that, but they won't. Yes. Um, so moving on to Israel and Gaza, quite a mess, quite a disaster. Um, if it's what happened on October 7th, obviously horrible and inexcusable. And now though, it does seem that Israel is, yes, going, that's, there are people in the Israeli government who have basically openly said, like, that's the goal. And it makes sense from a long-term perspective for Israel, because if polling is any indication we're at a high watermark for support for Israel in America. It's it's all going down from here. The Zoomers, I mean, the Zoomers terrify me on many levels, uh, but uh, they are definitely not going to be supporting Israel the way sort of American boomers do. Um, so especially like the evangelical sort of Christianity that supports Israel today uh, is not is also declining. Um, so, uh, yeah, they, in a way, I think they sort of are incentivized to be like, we better do this now because we won't be able to do it maybe even 10 years down the line. Um, there's a really great piece in Unheard by 
Eris, I never know how to say his last name, Rusinos, called The Truth About Ethnic Cleansing in Gaza. And he is not in any way some sort of like lefty, you know, from the river to the sea kind of guy. And he just lays out the history of ethnic cleansing in the last century. It's quite common and it's quite incentivized by the way global politics works today. Uh, and I didn't even realize this, but uh, well, so we've talked before, there's just an ethnic cleansing in Azerbaijan of Nagorno-Karabakh, 120,000 Armenians kicked out. Well, <laughs> Azerbaijan is going to be hosting the next like giant climate summit. <laughs> Uh, and an Armenian friend pointed out to me, Armenia itself voted for that uh, sort of as politicking, like to get some like uh, prisoners of war from the 2020 war back. But so, you know, international politics, quite a dirty business. But um, he also lays out several quotes from Israeli government officials being like, yes, the West has a moral duty to take up these poor Gazan refugees. It's like, what? <laughs> like, that takes some gall to say. But um, yeah, there definitely will be a push to for the West to just take these two million people. Uh, Arab states certainly don't want them. I mean, they've been quite destabilizing. Lead contributed to the Lebanese civil war. Lots of trouble in Jordan. None of these rich petro states will take them. Egypt certainly won't take them. They despise Hamas. Um, yeah, let's remind people that the West Bank was for a time a part of Jordan. And they had a whole attempt uh, at in domestic policy. There's going to be this whole, okay, we're going to take in all these uh, Palestinians and we're going to integrate them into our population. And all it ended up being was a, a nightmare because it created this whole new voting block within uh, the legislature and uh, created additional defense problems for uh, Jordan and, uh, of course, its, its ruling class. And they ended up – they were happy to see it go. Uh, I think many within Jordan were happy to get rid of the West Bank. Um, and they remember that. They remember how destabilizing, how problematic it was to bring in a large number of Palestinians into their country, which, uh, contrary to what Americans think, these groups are all not just ethnically more or less the same because they have the same religion any more than all Christians are the same. And so Gaza looks at that. And of course, Gaza or uh, Egypt looks at that. Egypt has very touchy internal politics. Uh, in terms of who's supporting uh, the current dictator. And if you were around, uh, say, about 10 years ago, you'll remember a lot of conflicts over <laughs> that with the Muslim Brotherhood and all of that. So they don't want a group that's going to come in and just completely rearrange um, the, the matrix of interest groups within the country. And that's what it would do. And two million people will do that, or just a million, or even just half a million. So... That's yeah. that's a problem. And the the one one plan that the Israeli various people in the government have put forward is, oh, they should all move to Sinai, and it's like Sinai Peninsula. I don't know exactly what its population is, but it's sort of been in a crossroads of the you know Near East for thousands of years, and there's never been a giant metropolis there. It's not exactly a lucrative. Uh, <laughs> great place to live apparently so i yeah it's quite it's a conundrum and it does seem ethnic cleansing is going to be the solution and the main question now is where are the palestinians going to go because no one wants them and so it's quite tragic for the palestinians israel i mean their reaction is understandable but not it that doesn't mean they are clear to just glass Gaza, basically. I mean, reducing the place to rubble and uh, totally understand why they feel that way. But I think in the long run, it might be a mistake uh, from, you know, in terms of just further alienating Palestinians and the Arab world. Uh, certainly seems probably a lot of future terrorists are going to be created uh, by this action and yeah, have no prediction there other than continued U.S. support for the time. Do you have being. any sense of what the timeline is going to be on this? Like how many years are we looking at before uh, Tel Aviv uh, 
say that their real goal is to just bomb the place until it essentially disintegrates um, in Gaza. How do you think they can just do that within the next year? I mean, I mean, I think probably, uh, I mean, the U.S. keeps saying, wagging its finger, you know, you need to hurry up and get this over and done with. Um, I I can't, I know that Netanyahu has said something about a timeline. I can't recall it off the top of my head. A, at least a year, I think, something like that. But then when everyone was outraged, she was like, that doesn't mean like full scale operations. It's sort of, you know, uh, will just still be involved in the situation. I have no idea what to expect, though. I mean, <laughs> predicting short wars, well, really, the length of any war is a pretty uh, bad track record for everyone. Well, yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> it's never over by Christmas. Even if they do have a... <laughs> yes, so true. And, and even if they do have a stated timeline in Tel Aviv, I mean, what, what does that mean? I mean, the U.S. had a timeline for Iraq. I mean, that was pointless yes. uh, and meant nothing. I mean, and they can't just, I mean, it, yeah, there's two over 2 million people there and it's not like they can just move tomorrow. And it's sort of like, as uh, Eris points out in this piece in Unheard, it's not like these ethnic cleansing movements of people don't usually result in like lots of death and killing. And it's like, uh, he talks a lot about, uh, I think he's Greek, so it makes sense to talk about this. There was the population swap after World War I, where they just uprooted all the Greeks in Asia Minor who've lived there for millennia and shoved them into Greece and took all the Muslims out of Greece and shoved them into Turkey. And he's like, yeah, half a million people went missing. It's like, today there are smartphones. So... You know, that whole gruesome, unpleasant process will not be like played out on the fifth page of the newspaper. It'll be like it'll be on Twitter, on TikTok. Yeah, like look at all these Palestinians dying and stuff. Uh, so it'll be quite gruesome and unpleasant, and uh, just lead to more trouble down the road. Seems to be a safe bet. So uh, here, I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to predict that uh, by the end of 2024, we will not have solved. Uh, foreign policy problems in the Middle East. So that's... Yeah, yeah. I think I'll join you on that. That's my bold It is risky prediction, prediction but... <laughs> I think, of course, the goal yeah. is just to keep the U.S. as minimally, from an American perspective, to keep the U.S. as minimally involved as possible. I mean, we can't, of course, hope to get the U.S. out of that um, completely um, unless some major change happens in the American electorate. Um, but... It, uh, it just the World War Three can break out there also. Um, yeah, that's also a um, a risk is that the U.S. I mean, there's a former Israeli general on the record saying like this is only possible because of U.S. support, and uh, the moment that stops, well, this all stops. So of course, in many Palestinian and Arab minds, it, the United States is inseparable from yeah. Israel's role in all of this. So, of course, that risks, you know, leading to blowback and all sorts of trouble here. You know, that's just what we need. Another terror attack to uh, invade somewhere else. Who knows where? But uh, well, and yeah. look at the way that different groups conflate uh, things for their own political benefit. Right. Uh, for example, just this terrible thing of equating all Jews with the state of Israel. And, yeah. oh, if you're a Jew, you must be in full agreement with whatever Tel Aviv is doing at any time, even if you live 10,000 miles away from Israel. Um, and so if you're just some Jewish student on campus, minding your own damn business, um, yeah, you probably don't want um, all Jews in Israel to be killed. Uh, but at the same time, that doesn't mean you're a big fan of Netanyahu. It's not like Netanyahu right, wins 100% yeah. of the votes in Israel when he runs. Uh, he's actually probably the war is the only thing keeping him in office right now. Yeah, I mean, he was sort of in charge when October seventh happened. Right. So, <laughs> like George W. Bush on September eleventh, of course. Uh, yeah. But uh, I don't know. The voters haven't seemed to figure that one out yet. Uh, but that's that cuts both ways, of course. Too is by 
uh, calling anyone who opposes whatever the state of Israel is doing, you call them an anti-Semite because Israel is synonymous with Judaism in that view. And then that just kind of supports the anti-Semitic view, which is I, I can if I attack a Jew in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, that's the same as striking a blow against the state of Israel, which is just bonkers. Yeah. But that's something of what uh, has filtered down to us by this trying to equate the two things. And that's very, very bad. Like you can't even you can't even equate uh everyone who lives in Israel with Zionism, like not yeah. everyone who chooses, not every Jew who chooses to live in Israel is necessarily subscribed to the Zionist ideology. Oh, so something like 20% of the pop, like of the citizens of Israel are Arab. There's that so, too. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, many of whom are Arab Christians, although far fewer now than used to be the case. Yes. Um, Cause I would have left too, if I was a Christian in that part of the world. Uh, yeah. He, uh, Eris in this piece in Unheard has a rather depressing but good line where he points out like uh, Christians in the Middle East survived 2,000 years of the Romans and the Persians and the caliphates and <laughs> European colonial powers, but they could not survive the American Empire. It's true. Same in Iraq. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's yeah, that's what he's saying. Just the whole Middle East. And it's uh, rather depressing when you think about how much the evangelical community supported the war on terror. Right. Things like yeah, that. Yeah, very shameful. Well, I mean, the truth is that um, some of them, the older ones, I think, uh, who remember the 70s, those people simply aren't Christians at all because they're Eastern Orthodox in many cases. Um, um, yeah, from, from, the, from the evangelical right. point of view. Yeah. Certain, yeah. Uh, so I think that was actually kind of part of it is those people just don't really, really matter. They're not part of the real Christian world. Um, so yeah, total disaster, uh, that's, that's brewing right there, right, right now. But yeah, I think we'll just continue to see the, the death toll mount in Gaza with, there's no clear, um, answer to that at all, but that takes us directly into just domestic politics, which is kind of our last piece of this is right, is the issue of, they're going to be asking, they already have been asking, running columns in the wall street journal and stuff saying, Hey, Americans, you should be taking Gaza refugees. So yet again, mm -hmm. asking American taxpayers, ordinary Americans to bear the burden of these foreign conflicts. So, oh yeah, you've already, you're already, I think they ran the numbers. Someone who opposes more money for Ukraine ran the numbers and it comes out to like 1500 bucks per household so far. Um, right. Just yeah, to yeah. pay for the Ukraine war. And that's not even taking how much have you paid already to ship weapons to Israel, to all sorts of other places where U.S. occupying forces are there, and they're all very expensive, high-tech weapons. I mean, you're paying through the nose through this sort of thing, and you're only now starting to see Americans start to really take notice of that, that how much they're paying for these wars that clearly don't have anything to do with their standard of living, even while inflation is through the roof. I mean... Good luck. I know that rich old guys at the Wall Street Journal keep writing articles about how everything's great and the economy yes. is swell. I can't talk to a single person under age 35 who thinks that expenses are not completely out of control, especially people trying yes, to have children. This is a, a rhetorical trick of saying, oh, inflation is down. Well, it's the the rate of inflation has decreased, but cumulatively, since Biden took office, it's at like 20%. Yep. It's like, but uh, what are you? Yeah, it's quite, I mean, that's, I think the whole vibe session talk is all basically gaslighting. I mean, it's like people just think the economy is bad when really it's not. And I think Peter St. Ange does a really great job of just sort of ripping apart all of the, you know, official regime statistics and saying, you know, basically every week he's just like, yeah, here's the job numbers. But actually, if you look under the hood, not a pretty picture. Here's this or that. Here's, you know, shipping companies are going bankrupt because <laughs> the economy is actually slowing down, yada, yada, yada. So. And so the question yeah. is, will that actually have an effect on the electoral cycle? Because foreign policy so... I mean, you watch these debates, and of course, I can't stomach a whole debate, but I do watch like the highlights later. And 
they're still trying to outcompete each other in terms of who can be the most belligerent candidate when it comes to uh, posture toward foreign countries, China, uh, Russia, uh, and even DeSantis is like, on day one, I will start bombing Mexico to conquer the cartels. Yeah. I, that still seems to play well, at least to a Republican audience. Um, I don't know how non-affiliateds will respond to that sort of thing. But I have a hard time believing that doubling down to the general population, doubling down on shipping, yep, we're going to get more involved in Israel, we're going to get more involved in Ukraine. I don't know if that's going to uh, really help. And so I would be surprised and depressed if that if that is the the position that a lot of uh, that the main candidates take. Um, now, Trump, I suppose his position is I always I always talk about how I'm just going to bomb all these other countries into oblivion and it's going to be no big deal and I'm going to do it in uh, six days. <laughs> And uh, but in the end, though, of course, all it really amounts to is a bunch of military spending with no actual new deployments. But yes, and he um, I mean, it's of course, he talked a good talk in 2016 and then he made John Bolton his advisor and Nikki Haley and yada, yada, yada. But he has said just recently he was like, yeah, I'll cut a deal with North Korea to just accept that they have nuclear weapons. And of course, people were shrieking in horror, but realists were pointing out, you know, well, that's right. the reality. So <laughs> should probably just accept that and, uh, you know, live, come down from cloud cuckoo land um, that North Korea is ever going to get rid of the right. nukes. Um, yeah. So foreign policy, I yeah, the, a general rule of thumb, I'm told by political operative type people is foreign policy is never decisive in a presidential election, but I think it can contribute to the vibe of uh, especially the Biden administration, especially if the economy continues to not do well, sort of just this domestic malaise combined with foreign policy disaster. I mean, if Russia, you know, just breaks out in February or something and starts carving up big parts of Ukraine because they have no troops and they have no money and they have no weapons, well, that's going to seem pretty bad because he's so much on the record of, we're supporting Ukraine indefinitely, la, la, la. Um, so that, I think, can just contribute to the malaise. On the Israel front, that could play a role because there are a lot of, um, there's Arab groups in Michigan that are like, we are not voting for Trump, but we're not going to vote for Biden. They're at least saying that now. And it's because of the, uh, uh, you know, the policy towards right, Israel. There's a large Arab population. Combined with, yeah. Yeah. Combine with that, I mean, I'm, uh, I hope I'm quite wrong on this prediction, but I suspect we're going to have a lot of, uh, quote unquote, mostly peaceful protesting next year. Um, the way I view this election, it's sort of like, I mean, I there's another prediction I'll make. Trump's going to be the Republican nominee, <laughs> even if he's in jail, almost especially if he's in jail, uh, which I doubt will happen before the primary is over and done. Um, and uh, Biden, they're sort of like wounded and caged beasts that are cornered, you know, especially Biden's son, Hunter, all of his legal woes. Uh, I, I think, don't remember. It might have been in the New York Times or Politico or something. It was like Biden is like obsessed with his son's legal troubles. His only you know, remaining son, his other son, passed away. Uh, and his Hunter himself has said like, yeah, I might need to leave the country if Trump wins. So... I do think both sides are probably going to pull out all the stops, which is worrisome. And it, we, I, I mean, on the one hand, you might expect in the past that would result in more foreign belligerency. Uh, so potentially we could see that directed against Mexico because of the border and drugs and who knows what. Probably some of China too. But... I don't think it'll manifest in Trump coming out and like, we're going to back Ukraine until, you know, 
until victory, especially because I suspect he has quite a grudge against Ukraine because of the whole first impeachment thing. Um, so yeah, next year going to be horribly messy. And uh, one side note, going back to the uh, Gaza refugee thing. Uh, so apparently Minnesota is trying to change its state flag and the proposed, so Minnesota has a huge population of Somali refugees. It's uh, where um, uh, Ilhan Omar is representative for Minnesota. The proposed flag that's like going to the committee to be like worked on is like practically the same as the flag of Puntland, which is a de facto breakaway state in Somalia. <laughs> so people pointed this out on Twitter and were quite like irked because <laughs> there's a huge population of Somali refugees in Minnesota. So it's not like these refugees have no domestic implications as the situation in Michigan, which was an important state last time, both in 2016 and 2020 shows. Um, so it's going to be a messy next year. I'm not expecting many solutions to foreign policy woes or much rational discourse on things. Um, I doubt Vivek Ramaswamy will be Trump's vice president. Oh, well, yeah, we have to talk about that, too. There's all this talk of Nikki Haley going to be Trump's VP, which I thought was just like crazy, you know, like there's always so much fear and doom mongering online just for, you know, sort of self-interested reasons. But no, there's like apparently like Trump's daughter was like, yeah, you can never say with Trump when she was asked about that and people have put out like statements to that effect. Well, I could not. If that happens, I mean, this proves conclusively that Trump hasn't learned a damn thing since his first. Yes. If, if that happens, I'll be flummoxed. I mean, on the one hand, it wouldn't be surprising because he's mm -hmm. made such horrible personnel decisions before. Uh, I would just, I would just spend the election season drinking heavily. I suspect if, <laughs> if Nikki Haley's the VP, um, but were Vivek Ramaswamy to be the VP, uh, that would actually, you know, white pill me a little bit, but I doubt he will be. But perhaps he could have some cabinet position in a Trump administration. But who knows? He's, of course, not perfect either, especially his comments on Mexico, like Ron DeSantis. So yeah. next year, I mean, this has been a unpleasant year in some respects. And I'm glad 2023 is coming to an end, but I can't say I'm exactly eager to get into 2024 either. So, <laughs> well, of course, uh, yeah. I think most of our listeners have learned, Zach, that you do not tune in to War Economy and State to hear <laughs> a bunch of happy news. So, uh, you know, we just deliver what our niche uh, comes to expect uh, at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, on that note, uh, we're, we're at an hour. So uh, let's wrap up this uh, episode of War, Economy, and State. This is the end of 2023 for us. We'll be back in January. So uh, yeah, if you've been listening throughout the year, thank you very much for joining us for this. Um, and uh, actually, I would say that if you are listening and you have some suggestions for topics in 2024, email them over to me. Um, and I would be interested to uh, see what you think. Uh, but until then, thank you. We'll uh, see you next time. <laughs>